My name's Cheryl Wagner, and I currently live in Fenton, Michigan. I became a part of the Pulmonary Hypertension Club, I suppose, in 2012 when my daughter Madison was diagnosed at the age of six with pretty severe pulmonary hypertension that was later deemed to probably be something she was born with and just went undiagnosed. Madison battled the disease for eight years. Much of that, she thrived. We adjusted as a family. She adjusted as a kid. And as she got into her teenage years, things started to get a little bit harder. The disease started to have a little bit more impact. And especially her freshman year in high school, it was evident that things were progressing, symptoms were increasing. And as we were in the process of trying to get answers on how best to move forward with this disease and with her prognosis and what surgical interventions were going to be next, she went into cardiac arrest while in the hospital and was brought back to be placed on ECMO. Um, which allowed her body to rest while hopefully she came back to us. But ultimately, in all reality, she probably passed away in that moment during her cardiac arrest. She was probably gone right away. And ultimately, we had to let her go. And so it is literally three years yesterday to the day when she did her honor walk at the hospital. We knew from a very early age that she was a big advocate for organ donation. And so she did her honor walk. We said her goodbyes and, you know, they wheeled her into the operating room to ultimately die as a hero for somebody else's child. An honor walk at the hospital is when you have a person that is an organ donor and they've been kept on life-sustaining equipment for that purpose, for the team to get in place, the matches to be made. And when everything's in place, the hospital staff lines the hallways with its nurses and its doctors and its support staff and its whatever family members you invite. They kind of make it known to other families on the floor that this is what's going to happen and welcome them to come out into the hall as well. And so it's kind of a hospital parade in honor of your child on their way to literally save lives. I mean, I guess because Madison had the wish to be cremated, that bought us some time in planning her celebration of life. And so we actually had nearly two weeks to put that together. And that kept us very busy mentally, just arranging the logistics of that and making it a really amazing event. After that, people are still, you know, very much invested in you and they're stopping by or they're dropping off lasagna or wine. And that goes on for a little while and then slowly it begins to trickle. And I think for us, we were in a unique situation in that, you know, literally a month after Madison passed, we were suddenly in COVID world. That definitely played an impact because now we had another distraction in the world. You know, now we had a, you know, what do we do with our groceries? Do we change our clothes in the garage? And do we wipe everything down? And and so that was another distraction. So I think we went from shock and disbelief and numbness, but then we had all these distractions for a good year. And I think we just kind of, for that year, we just went through the motions and, and we were in survival mode. I think, and just trying to hold each other up. And because of COVID, that's pretty much all we had was each other in our online network. And so that first year, I mean, I think it's really a blur. I mean, it's it's a lot of numbness. It's a lot of things I've forgotten. And it was just literally just, you got to get up in the morning and you got to progress and you got to go through the day. And then, you know, it changes after that. After that year, you know, there's obviously the cycles of grief and, and there's no manual for this, just like there's no manual for parenting a kid with a terminal disease. But I mean, you go through all the stages and I think we're still in the process of going through the stages. As a parent, I've gone through the guilt stage. We were not literally in the hospital When Madison had her cardiac arrest, we had gone home to grab some clean clothes to kind of tidy up a little bit um, because we knew people were coming to visit Madison. And that morning we had had to meet with a lawyer because my son Matthew's school was not handling his coping with his sister being in the hospital, sister being in ICU well. And they, they actually made motions to expel him while this was all going on. So there's a lot of guilt. I think Matthew holds a lot of guilt. Like we would have been at the hospital if we weren't meeting with a lawyer to deal with his behavior problems at school. And as a mom, I hold guilt for not being there. I question whether we should have done the pot shunt earlier. We had been evaluated for it, but the doctor said, not yet. It's too dangerous. It's not your time yet. But Madison had told us it was time. 
And we told her we have to try the easy stuff first. And that's what we did. And so I, you know, I still at times second guess myself there and there's guilt there. And, you know, at times you're angry. I question things still. I mean, I love my PH community and I, I love the girls that Madison met at conferences over those years. But you look at the picture of, you know, the six or seven of them all together. And so many of them were in worse shape ph wise than Madison was at the time, you know, and I never would have dreamed that she would be the first one to go. I would have picked, you know, one of the much sicker, much, you know, and so you question, you know, why is that kid still here? My kid's not still here. And then you feel guilty for saying that because you don't want to wish this on anybody. But it's just a tumultuous roller coaster of emotions through it. And along the way, you're just trying to figure out, okay, what's my role now? Who am I now? some of that, we're still figuring that out. Honestly, I still feel part of a PH family. But at the same time, I feel like, you know, I'm also from the parent perspective, we are an example of everybody's worst nightmare. This is what happens. This is the crystal ball. This is going to happen to your kid too, probably. I think a big focus for us has been continuing Madison's fight, her last wish for a cure. And we promised her we would never stop fighting for that. And so we've continued that. I think that's definitely helped. For me personally, it was just making sure I think she hasn't forgotten that her life meant something. Continuing that legacy, I think that's been very important for me. You never want her to kind of get stuck into the shadows of life, which is only natural at some point. But I also want the people who, who knew her, who knew her story, I somehow want them to kind of file that away in their heart and carry her with them too. The dreams are the best, absolutely. And I wish, you know, in three years having four of them, I wish that, that I could have one, you know, even greedily once a week would be great. But the dreams for me, um, and I've always been a dreamer. I dream the weirdest stuff. Uh, and, and it's very detailed, very concrete. Um, but these dreams are different in that in the moment and Madison's appearing in my dream and I'm there and it's so real. It is happening. It is all of a sudden we're on our deck and I'm talking to her and she comes walking up and without missing a beat, she tells me she was responsible for 172 rainbows yesterday. And I'm like, well, that's really cool. We saw a couple of those and we just talk. And there's like, for example, a vision of us walking down downtown Brighton. We're talking and, and just talking mother to daughter, friend to friend. And I don't get the specifics of that conversation, but all of a sudden we're sitting in a Chili's like situation and she orders lemonade. So I know it's Madison because she loved lemonade. And we continue our conversation and I'm acutely aware that time is running out. Like there's this sand time timer there. And I only have a few more minutes with her. And I'm just like, I want more time. And, and she's like, I have to go. And she goes, you wake up and it's just like, so incredible that she was there. And so I've had, you know, like I said, just three or four of these dreams, different scenarios. And I'm just so grateful for them. It makes you sad, but you're so thankful that you got to touch base. And there's so much about the human brain we don't know. There's so much about the universe we don't know. I mean, who knows what's real and what's not, but those are, are terrific moments for me, for sure. I treasure those. We moved from a bougie neighborhood in Brighton with a beautiful arch house, including storage and stuff, probably 6,000 square feet, to losing Madison, going through COVID, and I think for my husband, I, I teach high school. I very much love my job. It's my passion. My husband is in corporate America, makes a ton more money than I do, but does not love his job. It was really an eye-opening experience, I think, to what matters in life and how much do you sell your soul to the corporate world versus being happy and doing something you love. And so we went from our, what I call our arch house to buying some property in Fenton that had a very old farmhouse on it. And at the age of 51, my husband decided he wanted to be an organic farmer. Obviously a major life change for us. This house is, is maybe 1,100 square feet, but we're on 18 acres. It's year three of us running a community-supported agriculture program, a CSA. And it's grown from 11 members our first year to 50 members our second year and to in about four days time, we are, I think we're up to 80 members this year with the goal of a hundred. And so, yeah, very much a, a life 
reset, both in losing Madison and just having to rethink where we get our food and what we put into our bodies because the COVID situation and just really what's important and what do you want to spend your time on this earth doing? And for him, it was time to find some joy. Somebody along the way, along our journey, told us that we should get to know the palliative team at the hospital long before we felt like we needed to. Palliative is not hospice. It doesn't mean you're counting down. It's nothing but get to know these people. And we did. And so I was thankful to already have a connection with them in the hospital because, I mean, they did offer a bit of comfort while we were there those last few days. And so that was nice that not dealing with strangers, just talking with people that already knew us. We as a family were already doing family therapy in advance of Madison's passing. And I think that also was very helpful. Just already having a couple people that knew us, knew our story, knew Madison's story, knew the dynamics between our kids, knew the dynamics between my husband and I. And it wasn't having to sit down, explain the whole thing to somebody, you know, while we're grieving the loss of our kid. They already knew the story. And we were actually in that therapy office the night before Madison's heart cath. And she was insisting she did not want her brother to be at that appointment. And the brother wanted to go. And it was this whole thing. And I can still picture her sitting in that blue chair and saying, you know, I don't know why you guys are so nervous about this heart cath. I've done this a million times before and nothing's going to go wrong. And, and, and for the first time, on um, I think it was heart cath seven something did go wrong, you know, but having that team was very helpful to us. Just having already somebody knowing our story and being able to kind of slide back into that and deal with that. And then I think the third thing that made it, I don't want to say easier, nothing makes this easier, but we were very clear about Madison's wishes years prior to her passing. And so because of her pH connections, because, you know, we didn't have her live in a bubble, she knew that there was a good chance she would maybe need new lungs someday or a new heart or both. She had had friends who, you know, she celebrated them getting the call and they got their lungs and they're doing great. And so she was very much an advocate of organ donation and knowing that made it a lot easier to sit down with that organ team and check all the boxes of everything that they asked of you. And it was also helpful to us to know, and this was more through the process of going to family funerals and stuff, but whenever we went to one, Madison was very wise before her years and articulating what she liked and didn't like. And she absolutely like thought it was disgusting to have a body on display. She never wanted that. She couldn't understand it. And so we knew that wasn't the gig. She didn't want everybody crying. She didn't want it to be a sad affair. She wanted some elements of God and faith in there, but she didn't want everybody to leave just crying. And we definitely did not have a traditional funeral or celebration of life. We did it Madison's way. And, um, and it was beautiful. And it was probably the coolest funeral I've ever been to. But yeah, so just knowing that person's wishes, that made it so much easier in planning it. And going forward, I mean, I think... I struggle with this, but you have to learn to be kind with yourself as a parent and patient with yourself, patient with your loved ones. You're never going to be the same person as you were. And that's kind of what it is. You put the pieces back together and you're never quite the same. And the love for that person is in there and it's never going to seal over or seep out or it's always going to be there. But time definitely doesn't heal all wounds, but you do go forward. And that love, I think the fear of your child being forgotten, that love that you feel for your child. I mean, that's never going to go away. Just like with pH, you get that diagnosis. You're like, okay, what's our path going to be? This is throwing us a curveball and what's this path going to be? And losing a child, definitely unexpectedly, you just got to figure out what that path's going to be and what that's going to look like. And it's not easy. There's no timeline for it, but that's kind of how it goes. My name is Cheryl Wagner, and I'm aware that my daughter Madison was rare. <laughs>